freedoms. And third, but not least, Chris Fox, who I am proud to call him and his lovely wife, Courtney, who's with us today, a dear, dear friends of ours. He has been with the NRA, although he looks like he's 21, like he's been with the NRA for 21 years. And he is passionate about Second Amendment rights. One of the most eloquent speakers on this topic, he's executive director of the NRA Institute for Legislative Action and the chairman of the Political Victory Fund. And I'm just so honored and thrilled to be able to moderate this panel. And now, please ask them to join me on the stage. Come on out, let's clap. Is this is her mother and and now mother to two small children. You know, it seems like being able to purchase a firearm of my choosing and being able to carry that wherever my, me and my family are, it seems like my basic responsibility as a parent at this point. I have been unspeakably victimized once already, and I refuse to let that happen again to myself or my kids. So what can your administration see that these restrictions that you're putting to make it harder for me to own a gun or harder for me to take that where I need to be is actually just making my kids and I less safe? Kimberly now joins us. Kimberly, thank you for being with us. And, and let me first say on behalf of a lot of people, it's very strong of you to tell your story. And uh, we're sorry anybody has to go through that. Thank you for being here. Were you happy with the president's answer? You know, I have to say it was kind of a non-answer, more so than anything. Um, I feel like I wasn't necessarily listened to, but at the same time, he knew how he was going to respond. I didn't go into that town hall thinking that I was going to change his mind by any means, but it was more about starting a larger discussion across the country about sexual assault, victimization, and my right and everyone else's right to choose how we defend ourselves. Well, first of all, there is a rival group to the National Rifle Association. It's called the Democratic Party. <laughs> <laughs> anti-gun bigots. They are utterly intolerant to anybody else's view when it comes to, other than their own, when it comes to the Second Amendment, the shooting sports, and self-defense. But you watch by next summer, she'll, she'll be photographed walking around in the field like she's hunting, participating in the shooting sports with a, a gun uh, uh, resting on her shoulder, probably holding it upside down. She doesn't know what she's doing with it anyway. Look, if you want to reduce violence, and the president knows this, you target criminals. You do not target law, otherwise law-abiding citizens, and you don't make them have to go jump through hoops at a higher threshold to exercise their Second Amendment rights. But Sean, if he goes after the real perpetrators of violence in America, he would have to target the underclass young black male and who, who disproportionately is involved in all this violence, and he doesn't want to do that. Here's the truth about the Hollywood celebrities, political elites, and billionaires who attack the Second Amendment. The thought of average people owning firearms makes them uncomfortable. They don't like how the men and women who build their office buildings, vacation homes, and luxury cars, who mop their floors, clean their clothes, and serve their dinner, have access to the same level of protection as their armed security guards. They want you to surrender your freedom for a false promise of government-provided security they will never rely upon themselves. But no amount of money, power, or fame gives anyone the right to take our freedom away. At the core of the Second Amendment is the eternal truth that no life is more worthy of armed protection than another. That's what I believe, and that's what I fight for. I'm the National Rifle Association of America, and I'm freedom's safest place. This is actually my first one. Um, I keep joking that I feel like the freshman that got invited to the senior prom, but this has been amazing so far. Um, I didn't come to this uh, growing up in politics. I came to this in the worst way possible. In 2006, a stranger broke into my college area apartment, held me for two hours, and sexually assaulted me. I had to leave there at 20 years old and say, okay, this is how I'm going to die. And it was in that moment when I was completely defenseless that I knew I was not going to let this happen to myself, my children, or anyone else if I were equal. 
Um, I took my Second Amendment rights very seriously after that. I trained and learned uh, that concealed carry was the way that I wanted to best defend myself. It wasn't until 2013 when Colorado was trying to pass an expansive gun control package that I got up off of my couch and down into seats in front of my own senators that worked for me and told them this is how this is going to impact me. I am a survivor of rape and I am telling you that I want my right to choose how to defend myself and that for me is with a firearm. Why are you trying to legislate me into being a victim? And so from there, it kind of took off, and it's been great because sex assault and victimization should not be an issue that is owned by the left. This is a victim's right issue, and I think that the, the, we here at CPAC and people that represent us do a fantastic job of not just saying that we're going to protect you victims, we give you the tools to protect yourself. This has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here today. Ladies and gentlemen, this document, the Constitution of the United States, means everything to me and it should mean everything to you. This is a document of freedom and liberty in the United States of America. I took an oath to defend this Constitution. Gosh darn it, I better live up to that oath. These are your rights. They are not my rights. I am a defender of your rights. Now, as it relates to the Second Amendment, it has special meaning to me. And here's why. As you know, when this country was formed, this Constitution didn't apply to the slaves. But guess what? This Constitution allowed the brilliance of the Founding Fathers, this Constitution allowed for us to eventually get it right. And we did with the 13th Amendment that freed the slaves. But the 13th Amendment only freed the slaves on paper. And many of you may know it was the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause that said this document applies to all citizens in the United States, and that included newly freed slaves. My ancestors fought as well as the founding for this document to apply to us. Let me tell you what. Frederick Douglass said about the right of self-defense. Douglass strongly supported the right of fugitive slaves to have and use weapons to resist kidnapping. When government fails to protect the just right of any individual man, that man rests on his original right of self-defense, even if it means shooting down his pursuers. Slavery is a system of brute force. It must be met with its own weapons. He went on to say it's worth fighting for. Slaves plus guns equal freedom. The abolition of slavery was inevitably due to the arming of blacks. Now if you think for one minute that I'm going to see these rights back to the federal government or any government or any court, you better think again. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, fight for your rights under this document. Plus two. Yeah. Like it were my right, and it is. And I will die fighting for this document. Thank you. Oh, well, well. Thank you, Mercy. I want to thank everybody for being here today. And I want to thank CPAC for having this conversation because it really is an important discussion. It's a discussion that's happening across the country at dinner tables, at, at kitchen tables, where a horrific event takes place and people want to know, what do we do? You know, what is the answer? What, what can the NRA do? What can all of us do as, as concerned Americans? But what the president would have you believe is that the only way to, to care about your kids and do something is to hate firearms is to hate guns, is to hate this freedom. And that's not only wrong, it's divisive, uh, it's condescending, but this president, uh, we found out in the town hall meeting that CNN quote unquote town hall hosted, where they said, NRA, you can come, we get it that you're the biggest, you know, the oldest civil rights organization in the country. You can come, you can have one free screen question and no rebuttal. Look, the thing I love about the National Rifle Association and our members, we're not scared of anybody. We're certainly not scared of this president. We'll have a debate with him anytime, anywhere. But we're also 
not stupid, we're not going to show up at CNN and be a stage prop. So we said no. Instead, I went on Fox News and had a great discussion with Megyn Kelly on all of this. But the truth of the matter is we, we need to have a serious discussion about these issues. We need to stand with people who want to be able to defend themselves. We need to stand with our, our men and women in law enforcement. So I'm honored to be here with, with Kim and Sheriff Clark and really just look forward to having no pre-screened questions, an honest debate, and that's what we're all about. So thanks for participating today. Thank you, Chris. And although President Obama was invited to come, he was really scared about your questions, so uh, not You heard I was going to be here. <laughs> exactly. The sheriff is in town. So we love to start the question and answer period. This is really what the town hall is about. It's about the, you all, the audience, being able to ask these wonderful experts and we'll get started with Catherine over here. And please state your name, where you're from. Uh, my name is Stephanie. Um, two quick questions. Um, I can exercise my First Amendment right anywhere. How is it that if I exercise my Second Amendment right, I can go to jail? How did we get to that place? But my second question, and I really want an answer on this, is there any kind of legislation or any thought? I can drive from New York to California one driver's license. If I drive from New York to California, if a person accidentally crosses into a state where their carry license is not respected, they can they can do serious time. Is is there anything being done for a national carry? So those are my questions. Thanks for the question. It's a great point. The truth of the matter is, we're in Maryland today. Uh, I have a right to carry permit in Virginia. I'm not allowed to carry. I had to carry Sheriff Clark here today. To, uh, carry a firearm, and it wasn't easy. But the truth is, that's exactly what we need to do. We need to recognize people that they, your right to defend yourself doesn't end at the state line. It didn't end when I crossed over that bridge from, from Virginia today. And we need, Congress needs, it's long overdue for Congress to pass national right to carry reciprocity and allow anyone who has a legal right to carry a firearm to carry anywhere they have a legal right to be. If I can uh, briefly add on to that, I'm tired of the Second Amendment being treated like the bastard child of the Bill of Rights. Yeah. <laughs> As the questioner indicated, when you cross state lines, your constitutional freedoms follow you without restriction. If you get arrested in a state you don't live in, you still have the Fifth Amendment right to counsel. Right? You don't have to have a permit for that. You don't have to have a background check to have that happen. And that's why I have said no more expanded background checks, no more restrictions on your Second Amendment freedoms, and no more gun control. No, no, no. What part of no do they not understand? Next question. Yes, either side. We'll go back to Catherine. Oh, Jennifer. Do you have one, Jennifer? Oh, Catherine. Hi. Um, I live in Maryland, down in Worcester County, and of course, in 2013, uh, our legislature passed a atrocious gun bills. And we had rallies and we fought it. It didn't do any good. We're a very blue state, although we, thank God, have a Republican governor now. Um, but they, whatever the Democrats didn't get in 2013, they're going for this year. They want to outlaw BBs, guns, pellet guns, antique rifles uh, will have to be registered. I will outlaw private transfers, like between fam family members and even what well, to make all college campuses gun-free and knife-free zones. Um, so, you know, we're fighting this to, as the best we can, but do you have any tips other than letters to the editor that we can use um, to fight this? I would have to say, I think, first off, great question, but the tip is that your life is something that all of your legislators need to know about because your experiences are just as important as everybody else's. You need to get down in front of there, talk to your legislators, really, really take that action. And I know so many people think, well, my story doesn't matter. I was one of them. You know, if there are typically about
about one in four women in this country that are going to be sexually assaulted at some time in their life. So even if it's not you, you know someone like that. And think of all of the other crimes and just experiences that we all have collectively in this room. We cannot be ignored when it comes to that. That's, that's your tip, is that you have to take action and it has to start for those that are sworn to work for you. Jennifer. Hello, my name is Cody Yowes. I'm from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and I'm a college student at Millersville University. Uh, we recently had uh, NRA University come into a seminar to spread awareness about gun rights and the history of the Second Amendment debate uh, to the college students. And uh, I know somebody personally who had a very similar situation uh, as Ms. Corbin has, and I thank you for having the courage to appear in front of us today. And uh, on campus, what we had... And what we have on campus to try to prevent those sorts of things from happening are these blue poles with buttons on them. Every few hundred or few thousand feet on campus that if you have a problem, you can push it and the university police show up. And I'm sure as David, uh, Sheriff Clark could vouch for that, the fact that it takes time to get them there and that having a firearm carrying, uh, carrying a firearm with you allows you to have a more quicker response than the police would. Um, so my question for all of you would be, uh, well, the policy of the university is you can carry if you're you know, 21 or older in accordance with Pennsylvania law, but only in open space. You can't carry inside of campus buildings. So if I'm in class and a crazy person comes in and starts shooting at people, I can't defend myself, my classmates, or my professors, even if my professors don't agree with my right to carry. So how, <laughs> how, how can we as college students uh, try to fight to make our universities, our state universities, more like in Texas, where we can still carry in the classroom to protect ourselves, our fellow classmates, even though they may not agree with us, and our professors that preach against the second. I'll start off. You've already got the talking points down, so you're well on your way. So I hope you'll, uh, I hope you'll keep, I hope you'll keep uh, preaching the gospel there. The truth is, this is a part of the discussion that a lot of people find to be very uncomfortable. When you start talking about guns being introduced in school environments, the left goes crazy. Even some people on the right aren't comfortable with it. What the National Rifle Association has said is that our school kids deserve to be protected the same way our politicians and our athletes and our money are protected, and that's with armed security. What we said is the same premise that we dealt with after 9-11 when, when terrorists attacked this country by overtaking planes after that, the, the United States Senate voted 98 to 0. They don't vote 98 to 0 on anything, but they voted 98 to 0 to allow pilots to carry firearms in the cockpit. Now, not every flight has a flight deck officer. Not every flight has an armed pilot. But that wasn't the point. The point was to send the message to bad people that if you screw around on our planes, you might be met with armed resistance. We need the same thing happening in our schools. Again, they will scream as if it's going to allow freshmen to carry firearms. You have to be 21 years old to carry it, to get a permit in this country anyway, or in these states. So this is, these are fear tactics. What we're saying is take the stickers that say no guns allowed off the windows because it's not a school security measure, and let's make sure that we put guns in the hands of the right people to keep our kids safe and to keep one another safe. You know what? What we do to you folks, when I say we, I'm talking about the government in terms of your Second Amendment freedoms is insane. Yeah, you can carry a gun on a Tuesday. If it's cloudy outside, you better have a yellow shirt on in between these hours here. And how is anybody supposed to figure this nonsense out? We do not do that with the First Amendment. We don't do it with the Fourth Amendment, unreasonable searches and seizures. We do not do it with the Fifth Amendment, only the Second. I'm going to challenge you with this. Because I believe in our process, and I believe in America. I think we're at a pitchfork and torches moment in America. I really do. And so I, I have to ask you, and I want to ask you, I want to challenge you with this. What are you willing to fight for? What are you willing to die for? That's a question you have to answer. I'm not going to tell you, you need to do A, B, and C. You have to ask yourself that because as Judge Robert Bork said, very eloquently, you know what we do in America too often? We bitch. And then after a while, we acquiesce. They can't do that to us. Next thing you know, we just kind of like lay down. That's why I said this is a pitchfork and torches moment. What are we willing to do to push back against this tyrannical government 
as it relates not just to the Second Amendment, but to this entire Constitution, because it is being trampled on right now. Hello, I'm uh, Dakota Workman, a uh, student at West Virginia University, born and raised in West Virginia. And uh, I'd like to first off by thanking Chris and the hard work of the NRA. When I cross that line back into West Virginia, I'll be entering the constitutional carry state. And uh, my question is, is uh, as a college student, uh, what resources does the NRA have for us on campus to use to help push for things like campus carry? You know, it's great, and I know there's some NRA University activists out there today, so I want to thank all of you for, for what you're doing. And work with us. You know, we're, we're all over the country. We, we do have a limited staff. We have about 15 people in our grassroots staff doing the work of about 500. But we're flying all over the country, meeting with young people like yourself at college campuses, letting them know what it is that they can do to get involved, what it is they can do to get engaged. And as, as Sheriff Clark said, this is, this is a challenge to all of us. We all know people. We all have email list. If you still have a fax list, you can use that one too. But it's up to us to get out and speak. It was it was fitting that Sheriff Clark received the Charlton Heston Award because Charlton Heston talked about disobedience being in our DNA. That's who we are. We need to speak out. We need to speak out for what we believe in. And there are still more of us. And as long as there are more of us who are willing to sacrifice and willing to do something, we'll continue to push this ball forward. So thank you for what you're doing. Jennifer. Um, Kimberly from Connecticut. I think we all know what happened in Connecticut when somebody with a mental illness got a hold of a gun and attacked the school. Um, I myself am applying for my pistol permit in Connecticut, but how do we, how do, what is our argument back to people who say we can't mentally ill have guns and therefore we must limit the gun access? I mean, obviously we would agree mentally ill. We don't want these sick people with guns. But, how do, but, that, but then we say that encroaches on our Second Amendment rights. So how do you argue that point that the leftists make about more gun control regarding the mental health? I'll jump in quickly, then maybe Kim, you can share your thoughts on it. I have an article from 1968 in the American Rifle in NRA, one of NRA's publications, calling on Congress to do something about preventing the legal access of firearms to those who are mentally uh, adjudicated as, as incompetent or endangered themselves and others. The truth is, every one of these high profile shootings that have gotten so much media attention screams at the problem of mental health in this country. Yet, they don't want to get the mental health records into the NICS system. Uh, this, is a, this is the conversation that needs to happen that this president refuses to have. The centerpiece of President Obama's response to Newtown would not have prevented Newtown. Because background checks would not have prevented that horrific tragedy. And you know what? It wouldn't have prevented San Bernardino, it wouldn't have prevented San, Santa Barbara, or Tucson, or Aurora, or Fort Hood, or any of these other high profile shootings. It's dishonest what the president's doing. He knows it. If he wants to talk about preventing people who shouldn't have access to firearms, welcome to the party. The National Rifles Association has been doing that for decades, but we need to do something about mental health in this country, and unfortunately, this president's uh, been all talk, no action on that. I think one of the biggest parts that I was let down about the town hall that I attended was that had President Obama allowed me to clarify my point instead of doing a political pivot and answering the question he wish I would have asked. It was more of a, a conversation about mental health. As a direct result of a sex assault, I was diagnosed with PTSD, with depression, with seizures related to PTSD, and how many people out there are suffering from the same ailment? Uh, domestic violence survivors, people that have experienced childhood trauma, veterans that serve our country overseas and come back with these kinds of issues. And what President Obama is saying to us is basically you get to pick one. Either you can continue to have legally have your right to own firearms or you can get the mental health treatment that you need, and that is unacceptable. Ladies and gentlemen, to cap this question off, and you know this, I'm preaching to the choir here. Bad things happen in this world. There's evil in this world. All right, but I find it insulting to look at this mental health situation and paint this broad brush. And I'm not saying you did it, I'm just saying the way we look at this. The overwhelming majority of people who suffer from some sort of mental illness would never take a firearm 
and walk into a school and slaughter children. And here's the important thing too. These are individual rights. Because somebody else goes out and misuses a firearm should not impact on my right to continue to own and possess that firearm. These are individual rights. We punish those individuals, not people in the United States. We don't punish people who haven't been directly involved in things. And that's what this gun control stuff does. It punishes law-abiding people. Catherine. No? There it is. Hey, my name is Alex Hookman. I go to Hillsdale College. Um, in, oh, thank you. It's a, we're, we're very blessed to go there. It's an incredible college. Um, in talking points outside of Hillsdale, just with friends, I'm from Colorado, so it's friends back in Colorado. Yes, uh, great state. Uh, we'll talk about uh, you know where what's the limit of the Second Amendment in terms of what sort of arms can you carry, and a lot of people will shoot back at me immediately that Ronald Reagan uh, proposed an assault weapons ban. So we kind of get this conflicting part where, like, I mean, I love Ronald Reagan, I want to support him, and then he also has that aspect to him. I was wondering where is that balance at between you know, the strength of a firearm that you can carry and personal safety, and then how do you counter that point back to them? Sure. We've tried it. We banned some autos in this country for a decade, not for a year, not for 18 months, for a decade. Congress mandated a study be included as part of that ban, and it came back and said that a total of 3% of crimes are committed with rifles of all kinds. Not just the scary looking ones, but all rifles. And what they found is it had no impact on crime. And the reason it had no impact on crime, one, is because criminals aren't walking around with rifles by and large, and two, criminals by definition, as Sheriff Clark pointed out, break the law. So the only people who were abiding by it were law-abiding people, and criminals continue to do what they do, which is not pay attention to the law. And to suggest that somehow these rifles are somehow different, or fired differently from a, any other semi-automatics that have been around for over 100 years, is simply scare tactics by the media and by our opponents. So is there a balance? Of course there's a balance in everything. You know, people say, well, already believes that you, know, you should be able to drive a tank down the street. Maybe I'd like to, but I can't. I'm not saying that I saying that it would be a good idea, but the truth is we need to have a serious discussion about addressing the underlying problems, a serious discussion on mental health reform, a serious discussion on school security, and a serious discussion on prosecuting these these maggots in Chicago and these other cities who are out preying on innocent people. And to suggest that somehow telling me that you know you can't have a magazine with more than seven or eight rounds is going to Chicago is, is asinine, and to suggest that it's going to do something to prevent mental health problems in this country is equally asinine. So we want to address the underlying problems. Our opponents just want more restrictions that ultimately don't work. And that's the problem. As Sheriff Clark pointed out, the fallacy of gun control is that somehow there's one more law. Look, if we've tried to legislate evil out of people's hearts throughout mankind, throughout the history of the world. If we could do it, we would, and all of us would support it. But it doesn't exist, and that's why gun control has failed throughout history and continues to fail in this country. One of the other things that we have to get better at doing, and I said we, we all need to get better at it, we allow the left to control the narrative in this discussion. All right. Firearm is a tool. That's all it is. It's like a baseball player that uses a bat. It's a tool. Right? We need to get this conversation focused on the behavior. We don't have a gun control problem in America. We have a crime control problem. In right there. And if you think about it, more people are killed in car crashes per year. More people are killed by drunk drivers per year than are killed by firearms. Yet I don't hear anybody proposing car control legislation. <laughs> Because the car is the tool. It's the behavior of the drunk driver. It's the behavior of the reckless driver. And as a society, we all kind of agree on that, but all of a sudden, we get to the gun, and it's a problem with the gun. No, it is a problem with the behavior. So if we get better at controlling the narrative and keeping it focused on behavior, like the mental health behavior, and not the gun, I think we're going to come out uh, uh, better ahead than we are now in, in winning these arguments. 
and there are over, there are over 20,000 gun laws on the books already. Federal prosecution of those laws under President Obama is down almost 40 percent. Almost 40 percent. So if he's not going to prosecute the ones that are already on the books, what leads anyone to believe that he's going to prosecute the next one? Unfortunately, that's what we're dealing with with this president, and it's a it's such a dishonest approach to addressing serious problems in this country, and hopefully the next president will do a much better job. Jennifer. Hi, my name is Stephen. Uh, I study at the University of Pittsburgh, and uh, with West Virginia, uh, just recently joining Vermont as I have constitutional carry. Do you see any negatives or downsides to constitutional carry as opposed to uh, traditional concealed carry permits? Well, we've, we've actually